The first is from the book of Genesis in the second chapter, verses 4 through 9. These are the generations of the heaven and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not yet caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground, but a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground, then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, and the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then my second passage is from Psalm 139. Verses 13 through 16. The psalmist speaks to God. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and wonderful are your works, that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. All right, last weekend I was at a conference, the summer retreat for the Presbyterian, Taiwanese Presbyterian Church of Washington, D.C., and I spoke about science and Christianity. And one of those talks included some reflections on Genesis and the idea of creation and on the whole issue of evolution. I'm sure you must know that uh, many conservative Christians are very uncomfortable with the idea of evolution. <clears throat> but I refused to be uncomfortable with it, and, and one of the reasons is I, I tell myself this story based upon this passage, that when it says that God created man from the dust of the ground, we don't think that it was like making mud pies. It means that God made man from what was there, from the ingredients of the earth. And I have no difficulty with the idea that God used the processes of evolution to develop this flesh that we wear, this body and this mind in which we take part in this world. But there came a point when this instrument, this flesh, was ready. And at that time, God breathed spirit into us. The word for breath in Hebrew is the word for wind in Hebrew is the same as the word for spirit in Hebrew. At some point God added spirit to this animal flesh that we wear. And early Christians and medieval Christians had no problem with the idea that we were animals because they didn't think that we were just animals. We were animals with spirit and with rational minds. Now I'm not going to go into that in any greater depth. I posted that lecture on our uh, YouTube site, I want to work now this morning with some examples of what we have to gain by understanding and recognizing that we can put these two things together, our faith, our understanding of what it means to be spiritual beings, to be capable of thought and feeling and choice and decision and action, along with a knowledge of what this flesh and these brains are like that we live in so that we can take advantage of everything that we can learn from the sciences and even from uh, biology, medicine, and the whole idea of evolution. So I want to give some examples uh, of things that uh, have happened in the past when I have counseled with people or been talking with people 
about applications of this idea. For instance, when my children were young, they used to fuss about going to bed at night because they didn't want to go to bed. I mean, they were still full of energy and strength and excitement. And I told them, look, your bodies and your minds have been built with extra capacity to deal with emergencies that would threaten your life. So that if you have to, you can go 30 hours without sleep in an emergency. This is built in. Evolution developed this. But that emergency capacity, that extra ability, means that almost every night of your life, you have to go to sleep when you're not sleeping yet. That extra capacity means that you have to make a decision how to use who you are and what you've got and go to bed and go to sleep when you're not sleeping yet. A minor example. There are more practical applications. I once was counseling a couple as they were leaving for college. And um, they were already a couple when they graduated high school and left to go to college. So I talked to them. And I said, look, I don't want to know anything about your sex lives, and I'm not going to ask. But in exchange for my not asking, I'm going to tell you some things that I want you to know. And I turned to the boy and I said, if you guys have decided that you're not going to have sex until you get married, then you need to know that the automated programming in your head that was developed by evolution is going to keep telling you, wait, this can't be the right girl for you because you're not having sex. Because that automatic programming was designed to make sure that we did have sex and did have babies in the years before we also had spirit and choice and decision. So the automated programming is always going to tell you, no, you've got the wrong girl because you're not having sex. And you have to know that and say to yourself, nope, nope, you're mistaken. I understand where the mistake comes from, but you're mistaken, old back of my head. And deal with it by the decision you make and the way you decide to do things. I was afterwards, years later, told by the young man in question that that was one of the most helpful things that anyone ever told him about how to deal with this kind of thing. I mean, sex is one of those things where there's a lot of automated programming that goes on, um, and evolution has given that to us. Um, for instance, men think about sex a lot. As a matter of fact, when girls in my fellowship go away to college, I tell them, every boy you meet wants to have sex with you. Every boy you meet wants to have sex with you. The boys sitting here know that the mind automatically considers the possibility with practically 99.5% of all the girls you meet. I also tell them, but look, 97.5% of those boys are in control. They're capable of living with that because it's just something automated that goes through their minds and they don't dwell on it and they're perfectly well in control, so you don't have to be afraid of them, at least not most of the time. And for the boys, it is automated, so you just let it roll off your shoulders. No big deal. Mind you, it becomes a spiritual problem when you type in the URL and you go to look at porn. That's a spiritual problem. That's not the automated programming. The automated programming just creates the impulse. You've got to see these things together, because the automated programming is neutral. Sometimes it's helpful in doing the right thing or the good thing. Sometimes it's a little bit of a problem. But you have to make the choice. You have to make the decision and know what to do with it. It can be the case that physical problems have spiritual solutions. The people in Alcoholics Anonymous discovered this back in the 1930s. They started with the assumption that alcoholism was a disease, a physical disease, that if you drank enough alcohol, it made for a biochemical change in your body and in your brain so that you couldn't help being desperate to drink. And they started. Their first uh, uh, step in their program is, I admitted that I had no control 
that I couldn't help myself. But the physical problem had a spiritual cure. I humbly asked God to help. That's one of their steps too. And the whole program is a program for developing the spiritual ability to not take that first drink. Because after that first drink, then the physical problem kicks in. The physical reality of how this flesh is built and how this brain is programmed can be maneuvered, manipulated, and even controlled by the ability of our spirits to make decisions and choose courses of action. I talked at this uh, program last weekend after the, this speech to a couple who had an autistic son. And, and it was very difficult for them. And they were talking about the difficulties. And at one point they said, what do I tell? What do I tell my son? And I said, you tell him that it isn't fair. You tell him that it isn't fair that he has to do all these special extra things. They were talking about um, a program of behavioral modification and training that is used and is having a lot of good results with uh, working with autistic children. But it's extra work. It's hard extra work. And their son was noticing <coughs> that he had to do extra things that other people didn't have to do in order to cope with the way life is. You tell him that it isn't fair because it isn't. And the valuable thing about telling him that it isn't fair means that there's not something wrong with him. If it isn't fair, then that's part of the way things are built. It means there's nothing wrong with him. It's just unfair that he has to cope with this. And once he's relieved from the burden of thinking or worrying that there's something wrong with him, then it's easier for you to help him. Then it's easier for him to make the effort. I had a couple at the church that I pastored. Oh, goodness. Uh... Well, not quite 20 years ago now, but coming up on 20 years ago. And they had an autistic son. And they had moved into New Jersey, because New Jersey does a better job of helping with autism in the public school system than most states do. So they moved here to take advantage of it. And at one point, I was sitting in their kitchen, uh, talking to them, and the father said, shouldn't we do what the Bible says and get the elders together and, and pray for him to maybe... Is there a demon to be cast out of him or something? And I thought about that. I mean, it does say something very nearly like that in James. And then I had to say, yeah, we can do that. It'll be all right. I said, but the spiritual problem here in this family is not your son. I said to the father, it's you. You're the one who's so upset and so lost about this that you're spending all your time in your workshop or away at work, you're neglecting your older two daughters there's no problem with, you're not helping your wife work with your son, you've retreated and withdrawn from your family. That's the spiritual problem here, not the mental physical problem with your son. That's the one that needs to be cured spiritually and fixed. He started to try to do different then. It was still, it was still so hard. This was his only son, six years old at the time. He just couldn't work with his son. But he moved back to take up the slack with his daughters and gave them more and extra attention so that his wife was able to work with his son. And things got better and better. And he stopped hiding from his own family. And things worked out. I'm, that boy graduated from high school this year, just passed, having done just fine in high school, still autistic, but high-functioning autistic. And might not have been high-functioning if it hadn't been for all the work they did with him when he was young. These physical things and these automatic programming, even these damages that happen to us, also have the ability to be affected and moderated or controlled or mitigated 
by the spiritual attitude with which we approach them and the way we deal with them in prayer and in fellowship. I, I had a girl in that congregation who was working hard to get a good grade on the math part of her SAT. She wanted to go to college to study nursing. So she needed good grades on both sides of her SAT because she was going to have to study sciences and so on. And she got a medium lousy grade on her math. I mean, not lousy in absolute terms, but lousy for wanting to get into a good college in a nursing program where she was going to have to study from sciences. And I did some math, as most of you know. Um, so I was tutoring her in math. She was mildly dyslexic. And our tutoring ran into problems. And eventually, we worked and we worked. And her SAT score in math only improved a little bit. So I wrote this letter of recommendation to explain to the college that she wanted to go to about what we've been doing and why. I said, with care and confidence, I commend this girl to you. I'm the pastor of her church. I've spent dozens of hours this past year tutoring her in mathematics. She has a mild dyslexia. It does not affect her verbal skills noticeably because language is blessed with considerable redundance. But mathematics is stripped down and symbolically reduced to a non-redundant minimum. And for this reason, it tends to exaggerate her difficulties. And I mention these things so that you will understand what I have to tell you about her intelligence and character. In the course of our work together, we came to the point where I could recognize clearly and call to her attention what was happening. Time and again, she would understand a problem correctly, understand the applicable algebra or the geometry, and set up a problem for solution correctly, and then, in the working of the arithmetic, invert digits or operations. This did not happen always, maybe a fourth of the time, but when she got a problem wrong, it was more often from these mistakes than from misunderstanding the mathematics. And at that moment, she had to face up to the plain reality. Life is not fair. She had learned some math, understood it well, used it properly to work a problem, and still got the problem wrong. It wasn't fair. And in my capacity as her pastor, as well as her tutor, I confirmed its unfairness to her. I wish you could have seen how she took it, without pretense, without hiding from it, without anger, in sorrow, but without despair. She never gave up. We continued to study, and she continued to learn more mathematics and understand it better, accepting that unavoidable mistakes were going to continue to afflict her. This is why I know that she is brighter and more intelligent than she may appear in testing, at least in mathematics. But more importantly, she has shown rare and valuable strength of character. It is hard to measure this with numbers. I have recommended her here in such detail so that you will understand clearly the opportunity that you now have to acquire a student of surpassing worth, she is more precious than a jewel. These are examples of how when our faith is not afraid of who we are as physical beings, that we can apply our faith to what our flesh and our minds are like, that we can use our minds and our flesh to act in this world as people who were put in this world to know God and to be known by God, to love God and to be loved by God. I'm sorry that sometimes in our faith some of us get into a fight with the sciences, especially over this evolution thing, but I don't see it because I see only benefits from recognizing and accepting who God made us to be in order to recognize and understand how as spiritual beings we can live as creatures of flesh as well.
I give thanks to God. And I'm pleased that at times these things were helpful to people. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you that you knew us when you formed us in our mother's wombs. That you understand and know all the inward structures of our flesh, our minds, our lives. Thank you for creating them for us so that we might live in your world and be happy here. Amen.